Hello, my name is Arvind Ketterpal, and I'm a musculoskeletal radiologist at Mass General Brigham. Today, I'm going to be discussing the extensor mechanism of the knee. The objectives for today are to, one, review the normal anatomy and the MR appearance of the extensor mechanism and discuss pitfalls. And then we're going to delve into some cases of extensor mechanism pathology, and we're going to discuss the approach. In particular, we'll look at tendinopathy, partial tear, and full thickness tear. Uh, and we'll also finish up a little bit uh, with other pathologies just that we want to keep in mind when we're evaluating the extensor mechanism. So let's talk a little bit about the normal anatomy. What's included in the extensor mechanism? There's five main things that you need to know. One, quadriceps tendon. Two, patellar tendon. Three, the patella itself. Four, tibial tuberosity. Five, medial and lateral retinaculum. The function of the extensor mechanism is really to help with extension of the knee, but also to stabilize the patella. We are going to focus on the former today. So let's take a look at some normal anatomy now. So here we have on the screen uh, sagittal images through the knee up top with a zoomed in uh, on the uh, patella here on the top left. We have a coronal uh, here at the bottom left and an axial image on the bottom right. Uh, <clears throat> this is a proton density sequence in the top left here. And this sequence is really nice to look at the anatomy. So we'll take it from the top here. So the first thing we want to look at is the quadriceps tendon. And when we look at the quadriceps tendon, we can see a thin hypointense line, which is the most superficial portion of the tendon. And that's the contribution from the rectus femoris. Uh, and then we see more posterior to that, a kind of thicker line, which is a contribution from the vastus medialis and lateralis coming together. And then posterior to that, you can see a, another thin hypointense line. And that's going to be the contribution from the vastus intermedius. So that's the deepest portion of the, uh, of the tendon. Now, <clears throat> there's a couple of things you need to know. One, there's variability in how layered of an appearance the tendon has, meaning some of them might have three layers. Some of them may have a different variation. And there's number two, variation in the thickness of the layers themselves. Now, this brings us to one of the pitfalls that I wanted to talk about. What we have to be careful of is not to overcall uh, tendon pathology and confuse it uh, with um, a normal layered appearance of the tendon. So always keep that in the back of your mind when you're looking at a tendon and you're thinking, hey, could this be tendinopathy or is a partial tear? And just ask yourself, is this actually instead a normal layered appearance of the tendon? Now, if you look here, we have this is the patella itself, and the patella is a sesamoid. Uh, anteriorly, it's actually draped in the quadriceps tendon. So a very thin portion of the rectus femoris is going to come anterior here along the patella and envelop the patella there. And that uh, portion is called the uh, prepatellar quadriceps continuation. And you might see that in some papers and in some textbooks. Um, and that actually continues to our patellar tendon down here. <clears throat> the patella on the uh, deeper side here is lined by hyaline cartilage. So that's that intermediate signal. Now, if we take a look more inferiorly, this is going to be our patellar tendon. And similar to tendons anywhere in the body, a normal appearance would be a hypo uh, appearance. And then as we uh, take a look further down, this is the tibial tuberosity where the patellar tendon attaches. And the tibial tuberosity, what we want to remember is that it has its own ossification center. And so uh, in a skeletally immature patient, we want to think about that um, and think about the pathologies that can occur with that. Now, the patellar tendon can also have a, uh, a kind of uh, layered appearance, similar to the quadriceps, but not as much so. Uh, it's not as talked about as much so, but it's something to keep in mind in case you see that. Uh, and usually the patellar tendon attaches to the caudal 
kind of two thirds of the anterior patellar. And uh, sometimes there can be some deeper fibers which attach to the more inferior and posterior part of the patella. One of the pitfalls that I want you to keep in mind is that when the knee is in full extension, the patellar tendon can sometimes appear redundant and you can get artifactual signal abnormality within the tendon. And again, this is a case where you don't want to overcall it as tendinopathy. The second pitfall with this area that I want you to keep in mind is if you look on this, uh, uh, these images here, you can see that there's kind of hyper intense signal in the anterior soft tissues. And this can be important because you want to differentiate this from artifact. And in this case, this is actually incomplete fat saturation. So when we uh, scroll here on our axials, we can see that this is really, this is not edema, but, but instead incomplete fat saturation. So those are the, the main pitfalls that we want to keep in mind to review those. Um, we talked about uh, incomplete fat saturation. We talked about buckling of the patellar tendon when the knee is in full extension. And we talked about a layered appearance of the tendons, especially the quadriceps. Okay, so now that we took a look at uh, the normal anatomy, we're going to move on and look at some cases, and we'll talk about an approach of how to evaluate the, the extensor mechanism and what things to think about. So this is going to be our first case here. And whenever we're evaluating tendons, what I like to do is <clears throat> I like to look at the tendon and ask myself, does this look thickened? Uh, is there abnormal signal within the tendon? Uh, and the answer uh, depends. If the answer to that is yes, then I ask myself the next question. Is it fluid signal, meaning a tear? Or is it just higher signal, meaning degeneration, tendinopathy? And then I ask myself, well, what's happening in the soft tissues around the tendon? And what's happening to the bone around the tendon? And I try to structure my reports in that way. It makes it easy for me to to uh, give a description. So we'll start with this patient here. This is a young patient uh, in his uh, 20s. And um, we can see that the, the patellar tendon is looking awfully thick here. And when we move over to some of the fluid sensitive sequences, we can see that there is some increased signal within the proximal portion of the tendon. Uh, but there's also some peritendinous edema in the soft tissues. Uh, the next thing I would think about is I would ask myself, is there any signal abnormality in the bone? We don't have any signal abnormality in the bone here. The, the caudal aspect of the patella looks okay. Um, I would also ask myself, okay, is there a tear here? I don't think that there's a tear. The signal doesn't, it's not really, a, a, you know, it's, it's high signal, but it's not fluid signal um, and there's no gap there. So this is a case where I would describe this as, uh, as tendinopathy and having the, a uh, thick tendon is one thing, but having increased signal, that really kind of clinches the diagnosis there. Because remember, there's no, a lot of normal variation in, in the way tendons can appear. Let's take a look at another case. This is a 19-year-old male basketball player. And again, presenting, this patient is presenting with anterior knee pain. So we're looking uh, at our extensor mechanism. When we scroll through our patellar tendon, we see that proximally, we actually have some increased signal here. It seems pretty focal. On the axial images here, uh, we can see that it's, it's quite focal and the high signal is fluid signal. So it's the same signal intensity as the, the thin fluid that's in the joint. Um, and then when we look at Hoffa's fat pad, superiorly, we see that there's edema there. Um, when we look at the inferior patellar pole, we see a small amount of bone marrow edema. So right over there. And so when we try to summarize these findings, what we want to convey to the clinician is that it looks like there's a proximal patellar tendinopathy with a focal partial tear. You may want to give some, some measurements to give an idea of that. There's reactive bone marrow edema in the uh, inferior patellar pole, and there's adjacent soft tissue edema in Hoffa's fat pad. 
And the types of things uh, that you may have heard about would be like a jumper's knee. Uh, and in skeletally immature patients, we think about um, uh, Syndic Larson Johansson uh, syndrome as a uh, uh, traction uh, on the inferior patella. Uh, so these are all in that spectrum. Let's take a look at it, another case. Now we've seen tendinopathy and we've seen a partial tear of the patellar tendon. Let's look at a partial tear of the quadriceps tendon. This case is a 61 year old male who had a direct trauma, direct contusion to the anterior knee. When we take a look at the distal quadriceps tendon, we again see that layered appearance, right? And we said the layered appearance, that, can, that is normal. Uh, but we see all this high signal um, <clears throat> along the distal attachment site, and we don't see the fibers making it all the way through to the patella. Now, as we scroll to the right and left of that, we do see some of the fibers making it all the way through. So what we have here is we have distal quadriceps partial tear. And when you're describing this, what would be helpful to the a uh, surgeon is to try to get an understanding of, well, how bad is the partial tear? Um, and so in this case, we can see that it, it, uh, it seems to be a small portion because when we move medially and laterally, uh, the tendon is intact. Um, but the other thing we want to give a description about is going to be what layers are involved. And I think we can do that pretty accurately here. We can say, hey, the superficial layer here, the anterior most layer, the rectus femoris is definitely involved. And it looks like the middle layer, which is going to be the contributions from the vastus medialis and vastus lateralis, is also involved. The deep fibers, which we said are going to be from the vastus intermedius, seem to still be intact even through that partial tear. Once again, when you are reviewing a case like this, you want to then ask yourself, well, what's happening in the soft tissues? You want to describe the edema. There's edema back here in the quadriceps fat pad. There's also prepatellar and anterior soft tissue edema. You want to talk about the bone. Is there a disruption of the bone? Um, and uh, you can swing back to a radiograph to help you uh, see if there's any small avulsion fractures uh, that, that you can't see as easily on MRI. Let's take a look at another case. We have now seen tendinopathy, partial tears of the quadriceps and patellar tendons. And now we're going to take a look at a complete rupture of the distal quadriceps. And complete ruptures usually occur from either forced flexion or they occur from a direct blow to the quadriceps. In this case, we can see that we cannot follow the low signal fibers down to the patella. The patella also seems to be in an uh, abnormal uh, location here. It seems to be inferiorly located a little bit. And then we have all this soft tissue or low signal uh, uh, signal, which is uh, coming out of the joint really into the uh, prepatellar soft tissues. And we can see that really nicely on the um, uh, axial sequence. So in that case, in this case, this is actually hemorrhage that's coming through the joint. and Sometimes it can be low signal, like in this case, but sometimes it can actually just be high signal joint fluid that's leaking out through the defect. Um, and uh, when you're formulating your report, what you want to think about is you want to try to describe to the surgeon how much tendon retraction there is, what does the tendon look like, um, and uh, of course you want to describe the soft tissue abnormalities that we talked about. Uh, you also want to go back, and if you have a radiograph, this is many times easier. We just talked about that in the last case. See if uh, an adhesophyte has evolved off. And uh, the other thing I just want to show you with this case is notice that the knee is in full extension on this image or on this uh, MRI. And you can see that the, uh, the way the patellar tendon looks, it's very redundant appearing. And so that was one of the pitfalls that we talked about. So that's not, we don't want to overcall things here. So we've now looked at tendinopathy, partial tear, 
and full thickness tear. <clears throat> but what I don't want to do is I don't want us to think that everything is about acute injuries and overuse injuries. Um, there can be many other pathologies that can affect the extensor mechanism, and we don't want to lose sight of those. And uh, one of them is the case that we have here. So let's take a look. When we take a look at this case, we see that there's abnormal soft tissue anterior to the patella. It's this stuff here. And it seems to be anterior to the quadriceps, but it's also extending into the quadriceps. And when you look at the axials, this can really convince you that the, the abnormality is extending into the quadriceps tendon. Um, so we have a very infiltrative process occurring. When we look at the quadriceps fat pad back here, it looks like we also have soft tissue extending there as well. So when we see this, we want to start thinking a little bit outside the box. And what we don't want to do is we don't want to call this tendinopathy, right? Um, and you, you, and the reason why is because we know that it really shouldn't be affecting all the way anterior uh, to the patella. So this is actually a case of tophaceous gout, which is involving the quadriceps tendon. Um, and, and it's very important to keep in mind other pathologies like neoplasm, inflammatory pathologies like gout, infection, um, in the back of your mind whenever you're reading. Uh, and uh, you also want to just think about this when you're calling tendinopathy on some of these uh uh, on some of these cases, because it can be difficult to differentiate in many times gouty topus versus a tendinopathy. Um, so take a look, see, does it look expansile? Is it infiltrative? Um, and uh, in those cases, then you want to, if you're going down the path of gout, uh, ask yourself if there is an erosion in the bone. And, <clears throat> and uh, we want to uh, then look in the knee for other sites of gout. That'll really help you be confident in your diagnosis. And so, you know, gout really likes to involve the extensor mechanism, but also uh, take a look at your cruciates, take a look at the popliteus tendon. And if you have a radiograph, that's extremely helpful because then you can often identify mineralization. Okay, so to summarize, we've, took, we've taken a look at a few things today. We looked at the normal extensor mechanism anatomy, and we said that includes the quadriceps tendon, patellar tendon, the patella and tibial tuberosity, and the medial and lateral patellar retinaculum. Uh, this is essential to extension, of course, but also to stabilization of the patella, which we do not focus on today. We talked a little bit about pitfalls in evaluating these tendons, and the main ones that I want you to remember is uh, MR artifacts, so incomplete fat saturation is very common in this location. Uh, so if you see some increased signal, first ask yourself, is this real or is this an artifact? Layered anatomy, we said that the quadriceps has contributions from uh, the rectus femoris, vastus medialis, and lateralis posterior to that, and then posterior to that is the vastus intermedius. Uh, and uh, variant anatomy, the number of layers that you see, the thickness of those layers, that is all variable. Um, and then we looked, we reviewed some cases and we looked at tendinopathy, partial tears of the patellar and quadriceps tendons, full thickness tears. So we looked at the quadriceps and we said, let's not forget other pathologies. And we had a case of uh, gout, tophaceous gout involving the uh, quadriceps tendon. Um, and when you're reviewing these uh, pathologies, you also want to always try to keep in mind, ask yourself, is this an acute process? Is this a chronic process? Or is this an acute on chronic process? Because it may be a combination. Thanks for joining me uh, in uh, reviewing the extensor mechanism.